Hello, everybody. Oh, my, my mic, my mic's not on. It's on? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so last time we talked about the, we ended with the Gaussian distribution. And I told you a few properties of the Gaussian distribution. And uh, the beautiful thing about the Gaussian distribution is A, it appears many times in the world. So uh, using the Gaussian distribution is often a good assumption. Um, and that's by the central limit theorem. But there's other, other great properties about the Gaussian process, uh, about the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution is the black hole of distributions, right? So if you have a, once you Gaussian distributed, you kind of stay Gaussian distributed. Taking a Gaussian distribution and adding it up with another Gaussian distribution gives you a Gaussian distribution, right? Multiplying two Gaussian distributions give you a Gaussian distribution. Marginalizing gives you a Gaussian distribution. Normalizing, of course, gives you a Gaussian distribution. And most importantly, Conditioning gives you a Gaussian distribution. So if you have P of A comma B, right, then P of A given B is Gaussian. P of A is Gaussian, which is the integral of P of and of course, you know, P A plus B, etc. are all Gaussian. <coughs> so today we will use this. Right? View this as a superpower and keep it in the back of your mind. So what I want to do today is go back to linear regression. So remember, a while ago we talked about linear regression. In linear regression, we had the following model. Right? We basically assumed we have data. And so we made this assumption that the data, we want to do regression. There's no classification here, but we assumed this data somewhat lies on a line. And... Uh, this line is parameterized by w. Right? So you have some function w f of x equals w transpose x. That was the idea. That's, that's the model. And we're trying to find this w. Of course, the data is not going to lie exactly on a line. right? Um, so we assume there's some noise. And this here is our epsilon. And epsilon is Gaussian distributed. So what does that mean? Well, this means that this actually is a Gaussian distribution with mean w transpose x. And the noise is basically the variance is, you know, epsilon squared. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, do people remember this? Raise your hand if you remember this. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, good. And then we had two different approaches to learning this parameter w. And so, by the way, what I will talk about today, I already mentioned it last time, is Gaussian process regression. The way it's typically explained, right, there's just some very beautiful side of Gaussian uh, process regression, and that's basically that it's a prior over infinite dimensional functions. And it's so beautiful that anyone who describes it goes off for pages and pages about infinite dimensional functions and priors in that space, etc., which makes it really hard to understand. And um, so I'm trying to cut all that stuff out. I haven't found anywhere else an explanation of Gaussian processes where they don't, where they, where they manage to resist right, the temptation to talk about how beautiful it is to have priors over infinite dimensional uh, functions. So make sure you, you pay good attention today, because it's really, really hard. If you read the secondary reading, it, it will always go into that direction, just because it's, it's I mean, it is very beautiful. But it, um, it's hard if you, haven't heard it for the, uh, if you haven't heard it before. OK, so we talked about two, we had two different approaches to learn W. And the first one was maximum likelihood estimation. Does anyone remember what, um, what term we minimized here, or maximized? <sighs> oh, come on, guys. I know it's beautiful weather, but... Sorry? Yeah, so what, what does maximum likelihood about? It's always the same thing. What, what are we trying to maximize? So we have some... Okay, let me, let me give you some terminology. We have some data, x1, y1 xn, yn. And what are we trying to maximize with MLE? Yeah? That's right. The probability of the data given the parameter, right? 
And this should technically be a semicolon because we're frequentist here, but you know. Um, and so basically, what does that mean? That basically is the following thing: we sum over all our data, we take the product of all our data, p of y i given x i and the parameter w. Basically, what we are saying here is if we choose that parameter w, how likely is it that each particular xi gives rise to the label y? Right? And that's the probability of the data because it's already sampled, we call it likelihood. So we take the product over every single point right? and say, what's the probability that we, if, we if, the, if the data really follows the slope, what is the probability that at this value we get exactly this value? Right? So if you had something that, you know, let's say we have the following w here, well then you would say, at this point here, this x value, what is the probability that we get this, this y here? Well, it's very unlikely, right? So by maximizing it, we're basically shifting this, this, this line up. Okay, then we had map. Does anyone remember what we did here? What, what are you maximizing here? I know it's, it's been a while. What do we maximize here? And, yeah? That's right, we turn things around. We say the probability of W given the data. Okay? So here we say which W makes our data most likely, explains our data the best. And here we say given that we have our data, what is the most likely set of parameters? Right? And uh, so the way you do this is you actually use base formula. Let me do it this way. A base rule. So you basically say, well, that actually equals the same thing as here. The likelihood times actually a prior or this times some normalization. So <clears throat> if you use Bayes rule, then basically what this means is you have to put in this prior. And this again, we choose to be Gaussian. Now, one quick question. So we, we uh, P of Y given X, can anyone tell me what this distribution is? Well, I guess I just said it. X, I, W, right? Well, that actually is a Gaussian distribution. That's drawn from some Gaussian distribution. Defined here, W transpose X and some, some noise times I, right? Or, you know, sigma squared I. This is the variance. <coughs> okay, and that's, that's because for every single X, we have a little distribution which comes, you know, which is basically our noise model. So for every single point here, you basically say, well, that's the point by value you're predicting, but there could be some Gaussian noise. So uh, it's, it's somewhere around here. So ultimately what we're saying is our labels Y are drawn from a Gaussian distribution where the mean is just W transpose X. So the mean kind of shifts up here. <clears throat> okay, good. So this here is a Gaussian distribution. It's Gaussian. Can anyone tell me what this distribution is? This here is the distribution over, this is the distribution over one single point. This here is the distribution over the whole data set. What is that distribution? I give you 30 seconds, discuss it with your neighbor. Try to figure it out. It's a distribution you've heard of. All right, can anyone tell me? <laughs> <laughs> 
Can anyone tell me? Anyone who's brave? Gaussian? It's a product of many Gaussians. So actually, it's just a Gaussian distribution, right? Uh, it's a weird Gaussian. Um, and we'll get to this a little bit uh, later on in the lecture. So let's just go back to Emily and Matt, OK? And so what are we doing here, right? And I mentioned this a little bit a couple lectures back. So we have our data, D, which is drawn from this distribution that we don't know. And then we take this data and we fit this line, right? We fit our model W. And then why are we doing this, right? The only reason we are doing this is to make predictions later on, right? So for test point x, we would like to predict, you know, what y is. So in some sense, the flow is the following, right? We give, we're given our, um, our data, right? From that data, we, we learn a w, right? And then from that w, we can now compute uh, y equals w transpose x, right, for some particular uh, test point x. Now, this is all nice. But it turns out, actually, we can do something far more beautiful than that. And that's uh, if we kind of put on our, our Bayesian hats today. And so what Bayesians say is the following. They say, well, actually, wait a second. Right? You're only using this W to make predictions. Right? <coughs> At the end of the day, no one, like, once you've made your predictions, no one cares about what W you use, as long as it's correct. So why don't we, instead of trying to model the probability of W, and then make predictions with that. Why don't we, from the start, model the prediction of a test point? So here's what we do. We say we have a test point x, and we would like to know what is the label of that test point x. We don't know it. So what do we want to do? We want to model p of y given x. Right? And we have something else. We have our data. D. OK? Does that make sense? So that's ultimately what we want, right? The beautiful thing about this is this makes no assumption about the model, right? You didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't have to commit to any model here, right? And just saying, given that this is my test point x, you know, what's the probability of my, uh, what's the distribution of my label y? And let's go through this and think, okay, well, we make this, this assumption here that, it's, you know, this is linear. Um, so if we had any w, right, then we could just say, you know, we, um, so we have this, for, this term here, right? For a certain W, we can make predictions. Uh, so how do we get here? Well, the trick is very simple. We just basically marginalize out uh, the model. So let me just show you this. So basically what we do is we basically say, well, in order to make predictions, we have to have a model. And that's the following, W given X and W. Right? Uh, and then we know what the probability of W is. That's actually, you know, that's this term here. And then we can integrate out all possible Ws. <clears throat> so this here is the same thing. Does this make sense? This is basically the probability of, you know, in some sense, this here is the probability of this. I could just write this here as P of Y given X comma D and W, and then I integrate out my W. Right? So clearly that's the same thing, right? You can always, in probability, you can always add another variable and then marginalize it out. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything, right? It's like adding one and then subtracting one, right? But if we do this, then you can say, wait a second, the moment I have W, Y doesn't actually depend on, on uh, D anymore. Y just depends on W, right? But W depends on D. <clears throat> Any questions at this point? Yeah? Um, actually, yeah, I may have oversimplified this a little bit. Let, let, you know, let me, uh, I have to be a little careful there. I don't make it too simple. I, I try to make this lecture really simple. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, maybe not in the general case. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, any questions about this equation? Raise your hand if this step is clear, going from here to here. OK, good. Any more questions? No. All right. So this is what we want to do, right? Basically, given an x, uh, uh, point x, we uh, predict the label y. <sighs> and we have our training data. And now I, can I could show you, well, we can just decompose this and say, well, you know, if we had a model w, the prediction is very simple. This is just the Gaussian distribution. And we have this thing here. This is w uh, given d. 
Okay, so this here is based, this is the term that we already had up here in map, and this here is the term that we basically have here. That's the final model. So now comes the beautiful thing. So this here is a Gaussian distribution. Um, what is this? P of W given D. Well, this is P of P of D given W times P of W over some normalization factor. And this is just using Bayes' rule. Right? I can take this and use Bayes' rule, flip it around. Now, what is this? What distribution? The answer will always be Gaussian, the whole lecture. So but what is this distribution? <laughs> it's a Gaussian, right? <laughs> and what is this distribution? It's a Gaussian, huh? And now we take this whole thing, right? We take a product of two Gaussians. What is this? It's a Gaussian. Good, good, good. And now we normalize it. What is it? It's a Gaussian. Good, now we multiply it with another Gaussian. What do we get? And now we marginalize our W. What do we get? A Gaussian. This here is a Gaussian. And that is amazing. <clears throat> it's amazing because that actually worked, right? It actually worked that we took every possible model in the universe, right? And averaged every possible result that you could possibly have, right? And we still get a distribution that we understand and we can solve, right? Usually, see, when Bayesians say, they say, well, you know, ideally, we don't care about the model, right? Don't, you know, Integrate out the model. We don't need a model. Make it disappear, right? It never works. Here it actually works, right? Because everything is Gaussian, right? So you can actually make predictions without ever learning the model. There is no model. We, mar we marginalized out the set of parameters. We never had to find a single set of parameters. So essentially, let me just, just explain to you what, what we are doing here, right? We have our data set here, and we basically say, you know, I will never, I, I can make predictions for a certain x point, what the y is, without ever committing to a single line, you know, on which the data is supposed to lie. What I'm instead doing is I take every possible line that exists, and for every possible line I get a different answer. But these lines here are much, much less likely than these lines, right? So, my, my result will be heavily influenced by these lines that actually fit the data, and hardly at all by these lines that make no sense, right? Because they are, here is the P of W given D will be so small that they won't matter, right? But the question, well, is this the right fit or is this the right fit? In this case, well, what I'm saying is saying, well, maybe both of them have a point, and what I'm essentially doing is I'm averaging the results. <clears throat> and the nice thing about this is that what you get is ultimately a Gaussian distribution. So it solves another problem. It solves a problem that you usually have in regression. One second. Is that when, in, in, uh, when you get a, uh, a prediction, you don't know how sure you are about that prediction. Right? So let's say you, know, you go to a hospital and the classifier tells you, you know, you know, sorry, you have a terminal illness, right? And you will die, you know, in a year, right? What you would like to know is that, you know, how confident are you about that prediction, right? Is this, you know, are you 1% confident or 99% confident, right? So this actually gives you a full-on distribution over your, over your label. So it predicts your label, like, you know, basically just gives you a full distribution. And you can estimate exactly an interval and saying, well, with certain probability, you're basically lying here. Yeah, uh, Chris. That's right, I'm still making the modeling assumption that the data lies on a line. Still, for five more minutes, because we can kernelize this. And then, we kind of put everything together. And then it doesn't have to lie on a line. <clears throat> but a very good point. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> okay, good. Any, any other questions about this? Yeah? By P of W? 
Yeah, the, the trick is that we, that we choose this to be Gaussian. So that, this, is the, this, the, this is the trick. Because this is Gaussian, this is Gaussian, the, the, some, so this is in some sense the choice we have to make here. Yeah? Okay, good. So the question was, what if you had a different prior on W, right? Then everything falls apart. Right? So you better make this Gaussian, right? <coughs> yes, good point. <coughs> Any other questions? That's why you know, people love Gaussian priors, because <coughs> it's actually called the conjugate prior. So the conjugate prior is always the prior that basically, um, well, it gives the posterior the same distribution as likely. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, good. So we could now do this, right? We could now solve this. But actually, wait a second, right? We know that the answer is it's a Gaussian, right? So if the answer is a Gaussian, then we don't have to do any of this stuff, right? Because we know exactly what a Gaussian looks like. Here's what a Gaussian looks like, right? A Gaussian, we just say P of Y, for our, given X and our data, is drawn from some distribution, with some mean and some covariance matrix, right? This is sigma, sigma just stands here for the covariance matrix. So what we can just do is we can just, just fit these, these parameters, right? <clears throat> and try to, you know, basically, in some sense we are setting, you know, uh, to try to estimate, come up with these parameters, and then actually we get a distribution. <clears throat> so, and that's exactly what a Gaussian process is. So in Gauss's process regression, we basically make the assumption, which is not totally crazy, right? Because you just realized we arrived at that assumption, making totally reasonable steps, um, that your data is all Gaussian distributed. Now, let, let me just then explain what I mean by this, because it's a little bit confusing. Right? <clears throat> so here's actually, um, here's actually the true distribution, that we, that the assumption that we're making. We assume that all data, so we have y1, yn, and my test points, given all my x's, x1 to xn, that's my data set d, and my test point are drawn from some Gaussian distribution. That's actually, I don't want to reuse the mu and sigma. So this here is my, my Gaussian distribution, uh, mu and sigma. OK? <clears throat> so that's the assumption I just make up front. And if I make that assumption, I get to exactly the same result. So we may as well just make that assumption, and then you know, we get that much, much quicker. That's much, much easier. You don't have any integrals, anything. So here is the. Let me just explain what that means. So let, assume you have two training points, or you have one training point, one test point, OK? What does it mean that they are drawn from a Gaussian? Right, it's important that you understand this part now, because that, that's what always trips everybody up. <clears throat> what I mean is that, let's say I have one training point, one test point. So this here is x1, this is my training point. This here is x, my test point. <clears throat> If they're from the, if I say they're Gaussian distributed, oh sorry, actually, it does not x, this is y, sorry. y1, y, right? If I say they're Gaussian distributed, that means they have some Gaussian distribution. That basically tells me if I know the uh, label of the training point, it informs me about the label of the test point. Okay, and this is exactly what we did last time. Right? We saw this distribution. In this case, we say they're highly correlated. So if my training point is large, then my test point is also large. Right? This is likely to be large. Okay. And so now when you actually tell me the tra tra training value, then what I'm, you know, basically I, I can, um, you know, I, I can basically, this, this reduces to uh, just a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution, and that's the distribution over the test point. Okay, and that's exactly this thing here. So that basically says, um, given my training data, my test point just becomes a Gaussian distribution. Any questions? Let me go over an example. So an example would be, for example, a, um, well, let me go over the, the old one, but the housing, right? So let's say I want to sell my house, 
Now I want to estimate the highest price of my house. My training point, my one training point that I have is my neighbor's house. And my neighbor just sold his house for, you know, a certain amount of money. I know my house is very, very similar. So what I'm doing is I'm modeling this with the Gaussian distribution. I basically say here I have a distribution that's highly correlated. <clears throat> and if my neighbor sells his house for a large price, then I'm probably, you know, my house is probably worth a lot too. If my neighbor ends up not getting a lot of money for his house, then I will probably not get a lot of money for my house too, because we have very similar houses. Right? This, um, now there's one question, right? Where do I put in that our neighbor actually, and my neighbor actually has a similar house than me? Right? And that's exactly what we stick into this, this value here. Right? So this is the, the, the covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix, basically in this case, is a two-dimensional matrix where the, di uh, the diagonal entries here are basically the variance of the different uh, values. So this is basically you know, sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared. This basically tells me the variance of my own house. How uncertain, this basically says, how, you know, how uncertain am I in this direction and this direction? But these off-diagonal terms, they are the interesting ones. They tell me if this is large and positive, if this is, for example, let's say, you know, three or something, and here also three, that means that my neighbor is highly correlated with me. That means that my, the Gaussian looks like this. If this here is zero, then the Gaussian would look like this, right? So it was like, uh, I guess like, like this or something, right? Where basically no matter for what value my, my neighbor buys his house, sells his house, the Gaussian here looks always the same. So my point, my, uh, my house price is not affected by my neighbor's house. Okay? And so the trick is basically, if you just assume that your data is Gaussian distributed, the mean is not very interesting. You can always compute the, uh, the mean of your data, right? So you can just say the mean is zero and just add the mean later on. That's not very interesting. What's interesting is the sigma, right? So all you need to specify is the covariance of your, uh, covariance, uh, of your data. So basically saying, if I have a test point, which training points are highly correlated to my test point? Right? <clears throat> and what do you want? You want those training points that are very similar to your test point to be correlated, to basically have large values here in these off diagonals. And those that are very different to be zero. So let's say I have, I, have, I have two training points. Let's say this is my house, uh, you know, my house, my neighbor's house, and you know, Donald Trump's house in Florida, right? And so, actually, why don't you fill in that, that covariance matrix? You and your neighbor just sit down for a minute and try to figure out what does that uh, look like. The first one is me, Killian. Killian's neighbor, Donald Trump. I was like, what is it called? President of the United States. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> and by the way, I don't have a huge mansion with 50 you know, bedrooms. 
Okay, any suggestions? And by the way, the variance here, obviously, we have, you know, it's just about the scale, right? Which numbers are large, which numbers are small, right? It's like, um, so any, any suggestions for the diagonal? What should be the, you know, what should be the diagonal entries? Yeah? Just? Uh, I'm not, uh, not sure. Oh, I see, I see. So this, yeah, okay. So basically, you know, these are basically some just, uh, so the important thing is basically, let's say my house is a variance of one, right? My neighbor's house is a variance of one. Donald Trump's house probably is a much larger variance, right? Because he sells his house for 50 million or maybe 40 million, right? Et cetera, right? There could be a lot more variance, right? Let's give this a turn, right? Who knows, right? Uh, so that's in some sense you're basically saying, well, how uncertain, you know, are you about each individual, uh, each individual training point, right? Now comes the interesting part, is the off-diagonal, right? What can you tell me about the off-diagonal terms? And one more time, the off-diagonal terms basically tell me how correlated they are, right? So how much the value of one in some sense tells you about the other one. So what would you put in here? Anything with Donald Trump is zero, that's right, right? That's right. right? So basically, you know, me and my neighbor, right, our houses are very, very different than Donald Trump's, right? So Donald Trump sells his house for $50 million, you know, that does not affect my, my house price, right? Uh, so we are basically uncorrelated, right? Like the fact that he sells his house for a lot of money or very little money, that makes no difference. And my neighbor and I, right, well, we are high, pretty correlated, so maybe we have a 0.9 here or something, right? So maybe, you know. Uh, so, uh, okay, does, any questions about this? Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So here comes the last magic trick for this lecture. And then I, I promise there's going to be a demo at the end. So, uh, <clears throat> so what is this basically doing? Right? Basically, you know, once we have the sigma, right, we plug this into a Gaussian distribution. The mean is just the average house price in America. Who cares? This is easy, right? This, this is not interesting. It's just the, you just get this from your training data. And bam, what do you have? You have a Gaussian distribution from which you can sample you know, uh, anything, right? <clears throat> you can then just you know, look at the conditional, and for any training point base, for any test point, uh, get a distribution over, over uh, its length, right? So all you need to do to make predictions is specify this covariance matrix. And what properties does this covariance matrix have to satisfy? That's the question. Any ideas without looking at the notes? <clears throat> yeah? Positive semi-definite, exactly. And how, where, 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 uh, where did we hear this before? I know one place, in the survey, someone said that was positive semi-definite matrices are the worst part about this course. <laughs> so they keep, keep creeping up. Where have you seen positive semi-definite matrices before? <laughs> kernels, that's right. This here is a kernel, right? This matrix here is a kernel. It's a little bit more restrictive than a kernel, um, because typically, well, like, I mean, usually any kernel function actually works. Um, typically, we try to avoid negative values. Um, the reason you want to avoid negative, I mean, sometimes it's fair to have negative values. It's okay. Um, uh, but that would basically mean inverse, inverse correlated, right? Saying, like, you, you know, your neighbor sells something for a large price that reduces your, your house price. In some settings, that's actually, that's, that's fine, actually. Um, often, we just use non-negative kernels. So here comes the beautiful thing, right? We need a kernel function. Great. What else do we need? We need a function such that similar points have large values, right? That's what we want, right? So here, sorry, these are these, here, right? So me and my neighbor have very similar houses, so we want the value here to be large, right? Because we call it. And points that are very different should have small values, right? Again, that's exactly what the kernel function is doing. If I just remind you of, for example, the RBF kernel. Think about the RBF kernel. Um, well, uh, let, me, yeah, let me write down here. So the RBF kernel says k of x comma z equals e to the minus x minus z squared over sigma squared. Okay? So let's say we have two houses here. The different dimensions are maybe the features of the houses, right? So maybe, you know, 
you have how many how many bedrooms do you have right how many bathrooms do you have I don't know what was the previous sales price or something like this right well if you now take me and my neighbor we will have very very similar houses there's a very small distance so each of, each of the minus something very very small is you know around one right so it's pretty large right that's exactly what we got we got 0.9 that's what we want now we take Donald Trump and me right so Donald Trump Right, number of bedrooms, I have four bedrooms, he has 50, right? Uh, two for, I don't know, one for him, one for his wife. I don't know what the other 48 are for. <laughs> but uh, why not? <laughs> and uh, I don't want to ask, actually. Uh, right, so that, that's a much, much larger distance, right? For this year, this distance here is very, very large, right? You square it, right? This is some, some massive value. Right? E to the minus something massive is going to be very, very small. So we're going to capture exactly this. Right? These points have nothing in common. They're very far away from each other. Right? And so once again, what we're doing here is actually something like nearest neighbors. Right? We're basically in the space of houses. Right? And I'm here. You know, my neighbor's here. And Donald Trump is somewhere over there. Right? And we basically put these Gaussians around and say, if things are close together, then they are correlated. Right, then they influence each other's, you know, each other's labels. And if they're far away, then they're, you know, the label of one does not really affect the label of the other. It doesn't tell me anything about it. Right? <clears throat> and that's actually all we need to do. So, uh, I have no more clear board. All right. You're basically done. <clears throat> if you understand this, you're one of the few people who understand Gaussian process regression. So let me get, just go through the steps. So in Gaussian process re regression, what you're basically doing, you're making this assumption that P of you know, y uh, given x and your data is start drawn from some distribution. And for now, we just say always zero mean, because you can always add the mean at the end. It's not very interesting. Oh, well, yeah. Um, and then some, some function sigma, which is really sigma is just a kernel, right, where kij equals k of xi comma xj, right? So it's kind of a funky thing, right? So what you do with your, with your feature vector, you basically compute a kernel matrix out of it, and you stick it into a Gaussian distribution. Right? And that's all you need to do. And if I now want to know what's the prediction of a test point, I need to know, this is my test point, right? Oh, this is, uh, yeah, sorry, this is now. So what do I do with that, you know, when I actually, oh, sorry, this is not going to be. So this is, this is uh, x1, xn, um, y1, yn. And if I now want to know what's the prediction of one particular test point, that's now conditioned on, on the, the labels of all the training points and my test point here. <coughs> and this year is basically, this year whole thing is basically my data. <coughs> and what I get is actually something, you know, very simple. I basically get, this is again a distribution. This is not a conditional. So basically what I'm doing here, I have, so let me write this one more time. I see probability of y1 to yn, y test point, given x1, xn, and the x test point. Is Gaussian distributed. So this is basically this, this n plus one dimensional space. Now I condition on the first n because these are the training labels that I have. So I assume my data is from a huge, gigantic Gaussian distribution. And now what I'm doing basically I'm saying, well, for most of these, actually, I know what the value is, right? I know my, my neighbor sells his house, right? This is now a training point. So now I'm conditioning on the data that I, for which I know the labels and want to know what's the uh, value of the test point. And so that is now also a Gaussian with a very specific uh, mean and uh, variance. And the mean is the following. K star transpose K inverse times Y. And the variance is K star star 
k inverse times k star. And let me remind you of k, what k star is. Here, k, uh, the covariance matrix is the following. Uh, k, k star, k star transpose, k star star. So, here when I look at my covariance matrix, these are basically the entries of the training points to my end. This here is my test point. So this here is basically my house. The last column here is my house. This here is my neighbor's house, and this here is Donald Trump's house, basically. Right? So my training data is basically this block up here that I just call K. And my test point is the, uh, what I have star. And K star star is basically the variance of, my, of the test point. Does that make sense? <coughs> Sorry, one more time? Okay, good. So when we specify this, this, this covariance matrix, that's over all my data, my training data and my test data. So I just sort them such that my training data comes first and then comes my test data. And I call the, the column that's training data with training data, K, or the, the matrix, sub matrix that's training data times training data, K. That's basically the, how, that, that was exactly how correlated is Donald Trump's house with my neighbor's house. And then here's my test data. I'm the test data, so how, the first one is basically how correlated am I with my neighbor's house, second one is how correlated am I with my Donald Trump's house, the third one is how correlated am I with my own house, right, so that's a variance of my, uh, so that's, the K star is basically the correlation with the training data, K star star is my own variance. Any questions? Yeah? Yes, exactly! Right? This here is just kernel regression. Right? So it turns out, if we do this, we get exactly the same thing as kernel regression. Now I know what you're thinking. What the bleep, right? We just went a whole lecture through this and we just arrived at kernel regression. <laughs> but there's something beautiful that we got in addition to this. We got kernel regression and we got variance. Right? So we actually got not just a point prediction, not just saying, oh, the price of your value is, the price of your house is $350,000. It tells you, no, 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 the price of your house is an expectation $350,000, right? But there's a good chance that you sell it above $400,000 or something, right? And these distributions are worth a lot, right? Because if you actually, if you want to integrate your predictions, let's say you have a self-driving car or something, right? You want to know, Let's say, you know, you make a prediction and say, oh, this is not a pedestrian in front of me, right? You want to know, well, wait a second, how certain are you about this, right? And if you say, well, it's not a pedestrian, I'm 90% sure it's not a pedestrian, 10%, well, yeah, maybe it is, right? Um, you may still want to slam on the brakes, right? So these, these, these uncertainties are actually super, super important, right? And this is why I love Gaussian processes so much. A, because it's the most elegant algorithm, right? You just compute the kernel matrix, and then just, this here is the prediction, and this here is the variance, right? How many lines of Julia is this? One, one line of Julia, right? Two lines of Python. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, I can show you a little demo of the algorithm in action. Uh, Okay, any more questions? Someone had a question? Um, yeah? So this is nice having a distribution and all, but it, isn't our prediction basically still the same, only we now have a distribution to go along with it? Right. So he's saying, well, isn't our prediction the same, but we just get a distribution around it. Wouldn't you still just go with the same prediction, right? Yeah. Well, so if you just need a prediction, then we just waste, I just wasted your time, right? But actually, if you want to do something with prediction, with that prediction, if you want, for example, want to integrate it, right? Then actually distributions are really, really, really important. Let me give you a simple example, right? An obvious example is, for example, speech recognition, right? So speech recognition, the, you know, the system, like Siri, right? Here's from the microphone what you're saying, right? And let's say, you know, you could have said multiple things, right? You say ice, right? Well. Did you mean ice or did you mean eyes, right? Well, I have somewhat of an accent, so no one knows, right? <clears throat> but 
If you would just predict the most likely one, right, then you would just always take the most likely word that you just heard, but it could be way off. But if I give you a distribution, then I, you would actually see it could be ice, or it could also be eyes, right? Eyes a little less likely because the way I speak, right? But it's not, you know, it's plausible. The beautiful thing is now you can actually take the previous words into account and say, wait, wait a second, I just said, I look you in the, right? It's pretty unlikely to say ice cream, right? <clears throat> so, if you basically have two different probability distributions, you can now integrate them, right? And if they're both Gaussian, you get a Gaussian, right? <clears throat> and then you actually can predict the most, uh, most plausible word, right? And that's exactly, by the way, how speech recognition systems work. So, the actually audio, you know, the recognition of the audio is actually pretty un inaccurate. But what, uh, one of the big breakthroughs in the last couple of years was that basically, you know, Google and those companies could scrape the web and just got, you know, millions and billions of lines of text. And what they could estimate very, very accurately is which words are likely to fall after other words. And if you integrate that, that into the speech recognition system, right, and you basically say, well, you could have said, you know, one of these five words, but only one of them is actually likely given what he or she said before. Right? And in fact, actually, the way these things work is also given what the person said afterwards. So these recognition systems are always a little bit behind, right? They kind of also look into the future, you know, look back, right, and say, Given that I just said cream, right, it probably meant ice, right, instead of ice, etc. Yeah? Do you have to normalize your data because the kernel is so gravity? No, no, kernel is just a well-defined covariance function. Everything works out. And you can define any kernel function you want. Let me give you a little example where this is really, really cool. So here's a common... Um, Is this the right one? Yes. Oh, no. That's the wrong one. Sorry. Wrong demo. Um, oh, GP demo. OK, good. So here's a, here's a common case where this is used. Uh, all right. So here's a scenario that comes up a lot. And you'd be surprised, actually. Last time uh, I taught this, a faculty from, from the med school actually sat in, in the class, and, and he saw this, and, and he ran out afterwards and started a startup. Uh, and, <laughs> and actually, he, that, that's what he does now. Like, he's actually no longer faculty. Uh, so here's an example of a problem that's actually quite common. So uh, imagine I want to minimize a function, but this function is really expensive. Right? So you can't just evaluate it everywhere. Like, every time you, you know, you, you can query me, you can ask me, what's the value at x? And I give you the y value, but it costs you 100 bucks, right? Or it costs you five days, right? A typical example could be a chemist, right? Trying to, to set up some, some experiment, right? And doesn't know how much CO2 or how much do you want to put in of that. Or material science, you want to make a new material, and you would like to maximize the conductivity or something, right? But every time you make a new material, it takes you five days or 10 days, right? And it costs a lot of money. And you want to find the best material. So uh, that's called a minimization problem, right? And you know, before we had gradient descent and so on, right? But there's no gradient, right? What's the gradient of a material, right? Like it doesn't really exist, right? So here's what we do. We basically, we use, a Ga we basically uh, use Gaussian processes, and we assume the data is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And so this here, my data is now any x, you have x values and y values. Right? And so there's some function that I'm trying to minimize, but I don't know what that function is. And so uh, the only thing I'm doing, I'm doing, using an RBF kernel, I say the function is somewhat smooth. So if I know the value at a certain at minus 2, that's probably predictive of minus 2.1 or something. So it's smooth that way. So here's what I'm doing. Now I'll give you a single training point. What you see here, the red line, is my prediction of what the function looks like. Right? So right now this is just... Um, a straight line, so I don't know anything, right? So now here comes the game. I give you one value, right? I tell you, oh, I run an experiment, and it cost me 10,000 bucks, right? But here I know, at minus one, this here is the function value, okay? And now what I can do is I can refit my Gaussian process and say, what's, given that I have that one value, what is the Gaussian distribution? And this is what it looks like, right? And so let me just understand you. Where's the, you know, where's the Gaussian distribution here, right? The Gaussian distribution is kind of Coming out of this, right? At any given 
x lies, you have a Gaussian distribution. And it's centered, the mean is the red line. And this here is one standard deviation up, and this here is one standard deviation down. So kind of, you have to kind of think of this as a 3D thing, right? It kind of goes, uh, uh, goes this way. Does that make sense? And so for any test point now, if I, this is my test point, I get a Gaussian distribution, right? That tells me what the mean value is and how uncertain I am about it. Okay, does that make sense? Raise your hand if that figure makes sense. Okay, awesome. And here comes the beauty, right? The beauty is the uncertainty is very small around here, right? Because I observed the value, but it's really large here, right? So let's say I'm now trying to find the minimum. I want to find the material that minimizes a certain property, right? But I could search here because, you know, I want to find out new, run new experiments. I know here the function is pretty low, right? But I'm also not very, very, uh, I'm also very certain about the value. Here, right, the function, my predicted function is pretty large, but I'm very uncertain. So it could be that actually if I run an experiment here, uh, the value is actually, you know, lower, right? So basically what I could do is I could actually trade this off and now say, you know, here I know what I get, right? The value is around minus three. But over here, you know, uh, it's probably around zero, but I don't know, I'm really uncertain. So maybe I, I, I try this out, right? And let's say I try this out and I get a pretty large value, right? So this is what my function looks like now. I have to try, try another value here, <coughs> and so on. And so in searching for the minimum, I basically now know, okay, here I'm not very certain, right? I know this value here is a lot worse than here. So there's no point trying here anymore, right? But here is a lot of uncertainty. So maybe I should try it minus four or something, right? So you try it minus four and you get this value, right? <coughs> so now you know, oh, maybe the minimum is somewhere here, okay? Does that make sense? So you basically keep searching and keep searching. <coughs> By the way, this is exactly the technique they used to find the Malaysian airliner that got lost in the ocean, right? They basically, you know, they had submarines, they had to go down and try to find, does anything lie here? And they go, okay, now, now we're pretty certain it's not here, right? Let's, let's search somewhere else. And they just basically use Gaussian processes, right? <coughs> um, okay, we are over time already, I apologize. Uh, I will show you another demo at the beginning of next lecture. <laughs>